Welcome to the Beyond Capital podcast. In our purpose-driven world, leadership is increasingly crucial. Now more than ever, stakeholders are demanding the integration of social values and causes in everything from shoes to soap to investments. We are bringing you the stories of leaders that are marrying profit with purpose. I'm Eva Yazari, CEO of Beyond Capital. And I'm Ed Stevens, CEO of Appreciate. And this is the Beyond Capital Podcast. Today's guest is Ajeta Shah. Ajeta is the founder and CEO of Frontier Markets. She has over 15 years of experience working on business in rural India, including the microfinance, energy, access, marketing, financial inclusion, and livelihood industries. Her company, Frontier Markets, has built a scalable distribution model that works with 3,000 female entrepreneurs that are helping 700,000 households in India's last mile, helping them make sure they have access to safe, affordable, clean energy products and household goods. Ajeta's goal is to create a sustainable supply channel for a wide range of products for low-income households in rural India. Let's dive in. Welcome, Ajeta. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So I'd like to give a little bit of background. Um, Your company, Frontier Markets, has been in the Beyond Capital portfolio, the portfolio that I've created uh, for quite some time, since 2013. And when we originally started Beyond Capital, we thought of ourselves as funding social entrepreneurs. Um, You know, that view has has shifted slightly as we're living in a world where it's it's more common to marry profit and purpose. But I'd like to, to ask you first... Do you view yourself as a social entrepreneur, and what does that mean to you? It's it's definitely a good question. Uh, um, I I've been asking myself that question daily recently as well. Um, short answer is I do consider myself a social entrepreneur, and I'll tell you what I think is maybe the difference. Um, profit doesn't drive me first. Um, the consumer that I choose to serve, the market that I choose to focus on, the impact that I choose to create is very much resonant in my strategy of how I operate my company. And it's also very bottoms up value driven in terms of the 130 people that are on my team today that are serving the work that we do. So we do care about impact first. With that said, I think that the definition of social entrepreneur maybe has been um, tweaked or changed or maybe looked at differently in the last couple of years since I started. Um, I feel that earlier social entrepreneur as a definition, was impact only and maybe profit. Um, and eventual profit, if maybe profit. Uh, whereas we strongly or I strongly feel that as a social entrepreneur, profit is inevitable if I serve my customer correctly because I'm choosing a market that is really big and should be looked at with a profit lens. So I care about impact. I care about uh, the people I serve, but at the same time, I also very much care about the returns that I give to my investors. So that maybe makes me slightly different from a social entrepreneur in its traditional definition, um, but still very much a social entrepreneur on an impact perspective and probably a better uh, entrepreneur than some of the trends that we're seeing now about impact and profit, recognizing that intentionality is probably the thing that makes us different from others in the space. Thinking a little bit more about the customer that you choose to serve, Frontier Markets operates in what is commonly referred to as the last mile, and that's mostly rural areas um, in you know all over all over the world, even including you know, developing countries and, and the U.S. that are not reached by traditional distribution channels for basic goods and services. In setting up the distribution networks that you have, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Sure. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I appreciate the, the, the differentiation between last mile because I do agree with you. I think it's become a trend. Uh, traditionally, we look at last mile um, as a market segment that isn't being served easily, um, systematically and regularly by, 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 by the product companies or the service companies that exist. So in the context of the many, many organizations that claim to be in the last mile, that could be a tier four town, it could be an urban city, and it could just mean by definition that they're serving still quite well-to-do people, but not necessarily as consistently or as regularly as they would if it was a tier one city. Frontier Markets has a very different definition of last mile. We literally are geographically reaching the absolute last person that exists 
in a rural village who has probably no access to proper roads, proper infrastructure, and or even proper access to regular services. Um, a lot of markets today are serving, quote unquote, the last mile, where they're giving them access to aspirational goods and services that would make their life more convenient. Whereas when we define the last mile customer, we're talking about rural agri families who are in still a certain level of destitute or poverty. Uh, they're definitely not someone who's earning uh, wealth. Um, and they're people that are living in communities where they don't have access to basic needs not 24 by seven electricity, not access to regular internet, definitely not access to digital solutions, uh, not getting access to Amazon delivery. And so ultimately these are people that are kind of being ignored in the larger spectrum of a population, which is daunting, because as you think about India's population where we operate, that's still almost 68% of the overall operation uh, population are about 651 million people um, as our market segment. So help me out here. Walk me through what Frontier Markets does. Do you operate stores? What kind of products do you sell? What is the concept for the business? One major ethos of perspective. The rural household that we look to serve, we believe that we need to become obsessed with their uh, needs, desires, wants, aspirations, and understanding. So on the first ones, I'd say we're a very bottoms-up or data-centric company that cares about Um, getting to know the rural household first and understanding what they need and then building an entire delivery system around what they need and who they are and when they want what they want. So on the one lens, I'd say we're a very marketing centric company that cares about using data to make decisions. Secondly, I would say that we're a local distribution company. So what we've done is we've literally invested in physical um, brick and mortar service centers that are managing an area of about 150 households or about 30,000 households um, in one area where our goal has been to ensure that we're getting physical products. These could be energy appliances. These could be smartphones. These could be household appliances that they're getting physically delivered to the doorstep of where these rural households live, which is typically around 30 kilometers away. Um, and making sure that we have the right infrastructure of physical people to support that. That includes our own field staff that are delivery guys, installation guys, after sales service guys, as well as mentors that are managing, I think, the most important piece of our puzzle, which is our women entrepreneurs. These are women entrepreneurs that we invest in that are locally from the villages where our customers live. So I'll give you a very simple example. One village has 150 households. That's about 600 to 700 customers. There will be a woman who's been trained by us to physically market, sell, deliver, and service and be there as a center of facilitation for that customer base. That's what we call our offline setup. So is it? Um, Sorry, one last piece to this is the tech, if that's okay. Sure. Um, All of this then gets, all of this then gets operated through a technology platform, which is an e-commerce platform that has been created by frontier markets for these rural women to drive. So rural India is funny that way. You need offline handholding engagement, but also to make this efficient and scalable, technology is there as well. So we call it an offline online platform for the last mile. So no physical shop, but service centers and women that reach the doorstep. So is it like um, is it like a, a multi-level or are these individual women your employees? These individual women are not our employees. These are multi-level women entrepreneurs. But with that said, they're not typical agents. So they don't just sell independently and make money like a Mary Kay or an Avon model. These are women that are actually getting part-time hired by Frontier Markets as service providers. So they're earning commission on products that they sell as well as getting a service commission for the work that they do. Because we recognize data collection, marketing, and consumer partnerships is also work that deserves to be paid for. Got it. I'm sure you have some really cool motorcycles too, but we'll get into that in a maybe subsequent uh, interview. Just to deliver the goods, right? To get out there, you must have all kinds of vehicles. Um, our field staff, uh, that is our uh, service center, it physically uh, would ha- be located in a place where even a small motorcycle with a uh, interesting storage vehicle could be um, used to deliver. 
the key here is not having a lot of vehicles. It's actually just making sure you're able to use data, timing, and rules to deliver. So imagine a rural woman placing an order on behalf of one of her customers, logging it in on her e-commerce platform, that information immediately getting delivered to our branch and actually then triggering one of our delivery guys to come down on his bike to go and deliver the product to that woman entrepreneur who can then doorstep deliver that product to the end customer. So it's about timing and mapping. Um, and yes, some vehicles, but not many. Recording this podcast from Dallas, I think it can be a little bit hard to imagine the impact of some of the products that you sell. Can you walk us through who benefits from your work? What, how, do, how do the renewable energy products and, and other household goods improve their lives? Sure. Um, and, and I was actually going to bring this up. I was going to say that what I'm really proud of in, when it comes to frontier markets as a company is that we have, we're a very values-driven company that focuses on the bottom. Our first level and measure of impact comes from our belief that the rural household deserves to be treated with dignity. So for us, the impact that we create drives on ensuring that the right products and services are delivered to rural consumers that matter the most. Um, The impact that we measure is focused around how the products either create livelihoods, help uh, rural households spend money on better solutions or save money on safety and on aspiration. And that's really about then looking at the segments of products that we have. So just to give one example, energy access has been one of our core areas of focus because in rural India today, um, there isn't 24 by 7 access to regular electricity, let alone outdoor electricity. One of our top selling products is a very basic but required solar torch. This is a torch that has been used by farmers to protect themselves Um, and their families against animals that they otherwise see on a regular basis that leads to a lot of health disasters. I can't tell you how many times I've had mothers thank us by introducing a reliable solar power torch that helps their child not get bitten by snakes as they're going to the bathroom at night. So there's a lot of other like elements as we start thinking about designing this. Some other products that we've introduced that we're very proud of most recently has been Uh, getting smartphones with internet connectivity to the last mile customer. 90% of our customers today are using smartphones, not just to talk to people, but they're using it now to conduct business decisions, collect data, and actually be able to do cash transactions. So wallet systems and payments have become a really big part of what Frontier Markets does. Um, And then we have home appliances that, you know, don't sound as exciting as productivity, but when you save a woman literally five hours in her day because she's not just chopping and grinding because you've been able to give her a better solution that's reliable. She uses her saved time to do other income generating opportunities or, you know, shocking to the world, rest and actually take a minute to spend time with her children. So we start really looking at impact metrics in a very different level of seeing how are we creating a better life, an easier life or a safer life for the rural households that we want to serve the most. Yeah, and the the tagline of your company is Saral Jivan, which means easy life. And I think, easy life. yeah, I think it's something that unifies us, us all. I mean, when I was visiting your business in October, it really stood out to me that we're all we're all looking for an easy life. Turning a little bit to your product mix, I know you've created your own products um, as well as sourcing them from other manufacturers. Tell us a little bit more about what drove that decision. Sure. When we first started um, the company, we were very clear that we it, 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 that we wanted to create a mani- marriage between uh, introducing a solution that could be low hanging and easy to understand and directly address a challenge that a rural household is facing, while at the same time building a brand of trust. Having been in the microfinance space, I tried everything. I tried clean water. I tried healthcare. And frankly, energy was the, the one that stuck the, the, the quickest because when you go from darkness to light and you're able to actually rely on a product, you're able to trust the, the person that delivered it to you. Um, in our sector, however, unfortunately, we realized that a lot of the products that were being developed for this rural customer weren't necessarily designed with them in mind. So um, they weren't priced the right way. They weren't durable the right way. They weren't actually solving the problem directly. That is when Frontier Markets made a strategic decision 
to introduce its own branded um, clean energy products because that became our first entry or understanding to the rural customer. When that rural customer buys a solar torch or a home lighting system that was designed by Frontier Markets because it really does fit a purpose that the rural household was facing as a challenge, they trust us in a very different way. What we didn't realize over a period of time was once you've brought in energy as a solution and you've actually been able to build that trust over a period of time, that rural customer is not just looking at you to solve their energy challenges. They fundamentally look at you to create an ease of life. And all of a sudden, that same rural customer is asking you to bring in a lot more other solutions, whether it's smartphones, whether it's um, mixers, grinders, irons, to TVs, washing machines, refrigerators. All of a sudden, that customer is turning to you as Frontier Market saying, hey, we like you guys because A, you hear us. You then negotiate pricing and quality products of other brands that we like, but we've never gotten access to. You then not only introduce those products to us, you help us understand how to use it. You then get us the best pricing possible. You deliver it to our doorstep. And if there's ever a challenge, in the product for whatever reason, you're there to make sure that customer service is readily available to us. And that's what actually opened Frontier Market's ability to introduce Samsung, Philips, Kohler, um, and other branded product company solutions because they were creating great quality products in these categories. Their challenge was they were not being able to deliver to last mile effectively well. And that's where Frontier Markets became a bridge or a platform for other product companies in multiple different areas, including home appliances, productivity, and water. For all those listeners who have never been to India or England, a torch is a flashlight. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Which could just be a little bit confusing for some people who might just think this is somehow turning the sun's (laughs) rays into a flame that little kids are taking out (laughs) in the middle of the night to ward off the snakes with. Um, That's not what we're talking about. It's a flashlight. That is powered by the sun. I think I think that tells you how many years I've been living in India versus in America. Yeah, but um, that's funny. Yeah, cool stuff though. Just sticking in the rural household, and then I'd like to zoom out a little bit. Um, you have employed over three thousand women, and they've generated three million dollars in income, which is incredible for a population that typically lives around four or five dollars a day. Um, what I also love is that. In addition to integrating them in your business model, you have helped to challenge some social norms. Uh, These women's seat at the table has has grown and they're supporting their families in ways that they weren't previously. Did you envision this change in dynamics when you started engaging rural women to be your sales force? Uh, It's a great question, Eva. To be honest with you, no. Um, when I first met rural women in India, and again, to give the audience the context, right, um, Northern India, where we operate, is much more conservative. Um, and there's a fundamental belief that, that women are, um, their only purpose is essentially to be married and create babies. Um, they don't need to be educated. Uh, they don't need to have a voice. And fundamentally, they're supposed to be creating a family dynamic, which is not bad. It's just not linking. You would never link that to like a proper Salesforce business model. And so when Frontier Markets first started, we actually didn't see a role for women at all. We thought, you know, you're going to partner with rural farmers and you're going to reach rural families. Therefore, you should be working with men who are sitting in these shops and, and, and that's where the customer will come to buy the products that you're trying to introduce. It was only in 2015 that we learned that while the customers were men were buying the products because they had traditionally the money in their pockets, it was actually the women that were using those solutions. In fact, 70% of, at that time, uh, half a million customers, 70% of our users were women. What we learned was that when women saw a solution because they were the center of the challenge, Let's be clear, women were always the ones that were dealing with all the challenges that came with electricity access first um, because they worried about their kids, they worried about their husbands, they worried about themselves. Um, They were the fastest to understand why solar would be a good replacement for their day-to-day challenges. Now, to incorporate that as a strategy took us quite some time. We didn't 
see, we didn't know that women would be able to um, embrace marketing, sales, and after sales service the way they have. What we've learned is that one, we underestimated the role of women very significantly. Our women today are the best to gather insights, build trust. They can enter into any doorstep, any household, and have a proper conversation. They are hungry to earn income because these are the same women that were married at the age of 14 and at 30 by the time they come to us, they already have five kids and they really want to participate in the economy in a way that they've not been denied. All they're asking for are skills. They're asking for access to cell phones. They're asking for access to information and they drive it in a very amazing way. The most powerful part of this entire story for me, and even you touched on this slightly, is that not only are they earning a lot more income and being, building building a business opportunity for frontier markets, but when they earn income, everything changes because these women are not just spending money on themselves, but they're helping their daughters, um, you know, get access to private education. They're helping communities adopt better solutions and they're creating leaders all around them. So you're seeing exponential levels of impact that get created that I think, honestly, reflecting on this, we underestimated what that would be. Now that we know it, I mean, it's the core of what we do, and we see an incredible opportunity for the future of really scaling that investing in women is smart business, and the key to that profit and impact uh, combination that we are looking to seek to achieve. This question is probably going to sound terrible to everybody, but I'm going to ask it anyway, which is, um, you have the small village, there's 150 households in it, and you've identified your representative you've put her through training she's started up and she's going she's like one of the more prestigious sort of women in her area um what's the dynamic when that starts going like off the tracks um you know like she now isn't delivering it right or people don't like her anymore um it seems like in a small village that could be kind of like in a way a family business maybe a lot of um, I'm, I'm sure you have dealt with this. So I'm just curious um, if you could shed a little bit of light on how you, you know, maintain the sort of right dynamic there with, with really a single point of failure um, sounds like um, with that yeah. individual. I think, I think, I think it's a great question. And I think that, um, you know, I guess I'll answer this in two ways. Um, one is that, the whole purpose of Frontier Markets is quote unquote offline infrastructure, our branches and our field staff um, is it, we, we create that infrastructure so that we can support our women entrepreneurs and co-brand or co-build uh, brand equity on the ground. Uh, a rural customer very typically always says that they say two things, right? They say that, look, we, we know our, our Saheli, our women entrepreneur, because we've grown up with her. So we've known our entire life and therefore we trust her. But we're also really happy today because she's getting supported by a company that does not leave. And I think that's been a really important factor in really building out that value chain or ecosystem. You know, uh, a lot of companies that invest in women entrepreneur models, they kind of leave these women out in the cold, hanging, saying, you have the customer base, you have a relationship, here's a product basket, go sell. So if they fail for a lot of the reasons that you're mentioning, um, they're on their own. And ultimately, a typical company would say, all right, well, they didn't do their job and they will replace them. That's not how SM operates. We as a company really focus on data and building relationships and really trying to understand the dynamics uh, between the rural entrepreneur, frontier markets, and our relationship with that rural customer in itself. So if she is, for whatever reason, quote unquote, not performing, we would know quite quickly, usually the reason for her not performing has nothing to do with her being, quote unquote, bad or not good at her job. Um, it's usually some sort of personal conflict, right? I mean, we have to remember that we're working in villages that are very sensitive to realities and harshness of the world. Um, you know, um, there could be a health disaster. She could be getting married. She could be losing a child. There's so many other uh, relevant realities that we need to be consciously aware of um, that allows us to make a better decision on how to handle that dynamic. With that said, because Frontier Markets does have a very strong brand connection to its rural customers directly, uh, we're able to replace 
that situation if that is the ultimate requirement. Because our ethos or our philosophy is that the rural customer is the king. If a woman doesn't want to work anymore for whatever reason, we would always try to stick to our true focus, which is finding another way to serve that customer better. So you founded Frontier Markets in 2011. And since then, you've seen tremendous growth. You're serving three and a half million people. As you grew, did you ever feel like there was a trade-off between social impact and financial performance of your company? You're, so, so, so clearly, Eva, you're, you're asking easy questions today, right? Um, we always uh, do. The, oh, we always do, right? Uh, so um, uh, a few times, in fact, in the journey. And I think this is maybe where the challenge comes when you go from being a startup to suddenly growing. So, um, you know, uh, I think uh, th- there are two very specific moments that I'd love to share with the audience. In, in, in 2016, going towards 2017, You know, the Indian government announced that uh, there were certain, you know, cash value, cash value money that was no longer going to be valid. And they were going to get rid of that 100 rupee, 500 rupee note. And they were going to try to make India more digital. Now, that sounded wonderful in a larger scheme of things. But in the rural context, what that basically meant was the average farmer, the average rural household that was used to this specific kind of cash could no longer use the cash. It was no longer existent. That created disasters left and right um, because people didn't know how to access other alternatives of money. Now, on a social perspective, there was a lot of leaning in terms of people wanting us to solve their problems and we were trying to figure out a way to make it happen. On a business perspective, right around this time, it was also agri season and farmers wanted to buy torches, or now that I've known the terminology, flashlights. That's right. Farmers wanted to buy flashlights, and uh, Frontier Markets had the flashlights they wanted. In fact, 40,000 farmers were demanding these flashlights. Now, remember, they did not have real cash available to them anymore. So what should Frontier Markets do? On a business perspective, if Frontier Markets sells 40,000 flashlights to farmers, where we have no idea whether we'll ever get paid, we're making a business disaster choice, right? You could be literally starting a new financial year with over half a million dollars of debt outstanding. On a social perspective, you've made a commitment to serve this rural community no matter what happens because you fundamentally believe in easing their life. And I think this is the kind of conflict that every social entrepreneur faces. Luckily, I had a board that existed with you, Eva, And we had a debate about this and we had to try to understand what was more important. Now, where business and social meet a middle ground on a social enterprise perspective is that what we cared about at the end of the day was brand equity. That we spent way too much money, way too much time trying to build trust in these communities. And we were dealing with a hiccup and that hiccup needs to be addressed with sensitivity. Otherwise, we lose, lose the biggest asset that we cared about which was that relationship with that farmer in the first place that wasn't created in a year. It took five years in the making. And I think this is, there's so many moments where I, as a founder have had to take a step back and ask myself the fundamental question of why am I doing this in the first place? And somehow social impact and business blend for me. They blend because on a fundamental level, customer satisfaction impact, Brand equity and long-term gains and impact all for me coincide with the same lens, which is why I'm no longer confused, but it's also because I've had investors like yourself that have been there to help me kind of think this through without making maybe a quick or wrong decision uh, of what we're trying to build in the first place. Well, so what did you do? You didn't say what you did. Did you give them the flashlights? Or oh, did I did. You? Oh, you Sorry, did? Sorry, I we did. We okay. saved we saved the brand equity. We started with a large debt outstanding. But what, what it did was though it transformed the way those half a million rural customers looked at frontier markets. We went from being that was the day that we went from being an energy access company to becoming an easy life company, where those same customers that remembered our decision came back to us for every other product and service that they want to ease their life and they knew that they could trust us because we would be be there with them to the end. And just to kind of 
not leave anyone hanging, we did end up recovering that half a million dollars eventually. It took us a little bit longer, but it was totally worth it in terms of a longer term gain on growth, business, brand, and profitability. We wouldn't be where we are today had we not made that decision in, I believe, the right way. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a smart financial decision. I know John Deere is famous for that with their farmers um, when there's like a big recession or whatnot. They, you know, they always are supporting their customers and they have a lot of loyal customers for that reason as well, which is a different type of company, but actually a similar customer, rural customer, farmers, um, that, that loyalty is, is, uh, is rewarded over the long run. And they do have big ups and downs. It's a volatile business, weather and everything else that happens. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and, and I think at the end of the day, um, the challenge, I think more for, are you more social? Or are you more for profit is it, it really does. I think that that burden of decision is held onto the, um, the, the founder at the end of the day. Right. I mean, and so, um, I've definitely struggled with this because I feel like, um, you know, the sector probably pushed you in one direction versus another. It's taken me quite a long time, 15 years, frankly, to now have a much more clear understanding of what I believe is a blended vision, which doesn't, doesn't force me to pick one side or the other. If I understand that impact is brand and, 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 and scale and future viability is for a customer base that all of this matters a lot. For. Yeah. I've, I've really enjoyed uh, watching you on your pathway as the founder and CEO of this company uh, since we invested in, in 2013 You're a New York City girl like me, and you now live in India, again, where your family is from, But and you've also won dozens of awards, Forbes 30 Under 30, uh, you've addressed the UN uh, and and won United Nations awards, and you've been recognized as an exceptional entrepreneur. And since this podcast is also focused on leadership, tell us what motivates you to get up in the morning and lead with enthusiasm? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, um, I, I think, I think that, um, maybe my own journey or the contradictions or the challenges that I faced growing up, uh, probably always reminds me that I'm lucky. Um, you know, I grew up, as you rightfully said in New York, but also with a very conservative Indian family or society where I did have to fight to be a different girl. And, 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 and recognize that my journey wasn't limited to the uh, stereotypes that are there for, frankly, girls all over the world. Um, I didn't find my journey to be, uh, or, my, or, or the, the preconceived notions of what my capability or responsibilities are. They were not that different from a rural Indian woman, uh, which is really sad. Uh, but the difference was that I still had education. I came from a better privileged family. Um, and so I had the right tools to be able to fight out of those stereotypes to then achieve whatever I have achieved today. Um, and I think that it's always a constant reminder when I meet the kind of rural women that I do, when I even meet the staff that I do, right? I mean, today we have 130 staff, um, and of which now we're struggling but trying really hard to constantly keep at least 40 to 50% of that staff gender equal because, you know, urban women in India today are not facing very different challenges than I did growing up. Um, and that was like 35 years ago. So you're constantly looking at the world and you're constantly trying to see where the changes need to come. You realize very quickly that it's not just about your journey, but it's about everyone else's journey that you can create. And I believe in power of platform. Um, hence why my 3 million rural consumers finally have a voice in a way that actually creates an impactful difference for everyone around them. Um, I don't, I think that that follows me for everything that I do, um, uh, whether it's our staff, whether it's even colleagues that we're really trying to motivate. Um, I think even, you know, this, I mentor a lot of, uh, startup women entrepreneurs, um, trying to help them, you know, get through the, the treasuries or dredgeries of being a social entrepreneur faster. Cause I think the world needs it. And, and I think that, um, I'm, I'm just lucky to be able to combine my experience, my humility, my family, my support, mentors like you that really helped me drive uh, this at an exponential way, recognizing it's not about me, but it's about the impact we can create all around us. 
I'm really excited to ask you this last question because I know you have big plans for your company. What is next for Frontier Markets and what mark do you hope your company will leave on the world? I'm, ex- I'm excited in, in, in two different levels. Um, uh, one is, I think, for Frontier Markets directly, I think we're hitting this really exciting inflection point where we're going to become India's first offline, online, so tech and offline, gender-enabled um, access company. Like, in not just India, I think the world that is profitable and that is also scaling rapidly. So in the next five years, I see our, just on a numbers perspective, I see us going from a network of 3,000 women to almost 50,000 women, 3 million customers to 100 million customers, pan India, and really driving uh, products and services to rural households to create a dignity and the next economy in a way that's extremely exciting. We have really exciting partnerships coming up with folks like Unilever, Gates Foundation, um, Amazon, and others that are really recognizing that rural households deserve a platform of voice and services in a way that I think Frontier Markets is going to be a leader in driving that and making that happen. Personally, um, I'm extremely excited to see how the leadership is evolving and changing. In the next three, four years, you're really not going to hear about me in Frontier Markets, but you're going to hear about the, the, the 20 people that have been instrumental in making that scale happen, Pan India, and becoming global leaders in distribution, telecom, digitization, and innovation in a way that I'm really, really excited about. And on a global perspective, I think that, you know, every founder's dream, um, and maybe specifically mine, as a woman CEO working in a social enterprise company that is last mile, I'm really excited to hopefully be one of the first unicorn stories that actually exits all of its investors commercially and creating this amazing impact. And I think that that's really something that we're all driving to see. We're driving to see the next big economy, the next big excitement that can manage both impact and profitability at the same time. And I'm really hopeful that I think myself, Frontier Marcus, and the team will become that story or that example that can take the scale. Uh, we have a foundation in the U.S. that you know about, Eva, that has always hoped for that, that the learnings that came from frontier markets in India could be replicated globally and inspire other organizations to repeat models that can work. So through the foundation, we've actually lined up our next 10 countries and 10 organizations that we're hoping to work with very closely to create replicable, scalable models that come from Frontier Markets as an inspiration in the next coming years. So there's a lot of exciting stuff to happen. And, and I think it's really exciting to see the roles that um, our mentors, our investors will play, not just in making that happen at Frontier Markets or for myself, but also, I think, globally uh, to become leaders in that same way. That's really exciting. Absolutely. Thank you, Ajita. It's, it's been a pleasure to have you, as always. And um, congratulations on everything. That's, that's all I can always say to you. No, thank you so much. And, and like I said, I mean, I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I'll just like close this on with one note. Like, um, I think Eva, like for me, uh, Beyond Capital Fund has been around since the earlier days. And um, I think, uh, you know, one thing that we, I always like, like touching upon is that whatever has been achieved by Frontier Markets or by me personally or by the sector, it really does take partnerships like Beyond Capital Fund to make that happen. So super appreciative of your approach to not just money, but also resources and guidance and advisory it really has allowed us to achieve what we have to this date. And I'm pretty confident that it's going to help uh, scale the learnings even further going forward. So thank you so much for your leadership as well. Thank you. Oh. Have a great day. And we know you have some business meetings. Yes. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. 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 Once again, it's clear that a business leader with good intentions can create an impressive social, environmental, and ethical impact. There is always a way to put meaning behind the mission of a company, and we can all make a difference. You've taken the first step by listening to the Beyond Capital podcast. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to rate, review, And if you haven't yet, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For more information, go to beyondcapitalpodcast.com. You can follow me on Twitter at EA Stevens. And follow me on Instagram at Conscious Investor. Until next time. Bye, everyone.